Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Grand Rounds. Uh, I've been given the great honor to introduce a pair of my senior statesmen uh, as a true dual double treat that we have this morning with Dr. R. Bobby and Dr. O'Keefe speaking at Grand Rounds. Uh, I'm going to do them separately because their talks truly are different, and I don't want you to have to remember the two introductions at the same time. But Saman Arbabi is a senior member of the team at Harborview. Um, Sam has been there longer than I can remember. He uh, trained with us. He's just like the residents in this room at one time. It may be hard to imagine. Uh, he stayed and worked in the laboratory as an NIH postdoctoral fellow for two years in basic cell biology, became an excellent cell biologist. Uh, during his fellowship also obtained his MPH in epidemiology, which relates to the second half of his talk. But uh, Sam uh, was well funded did, as I say, superb cell biology, looking at the inflammatory response to injury and sepsis, and became interested in wound healing as a byproduct of some of his studies, showing that the ability to modify wound healing by modifying the immunologic response to injury has had some excellent ongoing results, which I'm sure most of you aren't aware of, and he's a, a breeder of pigs now, and uh, burns them, and uh, based on his molecular and cell biology background, has been able to modify the ability of a wound to heal with less scarring, with less systemic impact, with less physiologic impact. But simultaneously, as he has progressed through the uh, department uh, ranks, has also used his epidemiology background, has been very interested, as we all are at Harvard Review, in trauma. Sam has focused on uh, outcomes of trauma, in particular geriatric outcomes and the impact of the trauma system and our current care of these patients to try and identify the impact of aging and the system of care that we have for our patients on their ultimate outcomes. And so, with that extensive background in both worlds, Sam's talk today is research and transition. He's going to look at both the uh, benefits and uh, difficulties in going from the bench to the bedside and the uh, joys that one can achieve doing it. Sam, please. Is this on? Oh, yeah, it is on. Well, thank you, Dr. Mayer. Thank you, everybody. Well, my talk is given already, so uh, I think I should just go sit down. That's basically, that was it. Um, today's talk is going to be, uh, I'm going to tell you a story, but the goal of my story is to um, tell you things that I think I did okay, things that I could have done better, and maybe from my story you will learn something, and that's at least my hope. So the goal of the story is to to uh, be able to give some advice, uh, whether it's right or not, uh, you will decide. Um, I am an immigrant, so uh, I, I have had a path. Uh, the guy that is running it feels that way, that you start running and you can't look around and just continue to run. And you get out, I me mean, getting out of the country that I was in, that's a whole lot of story. It's actually a funny story, sometimes very scary. Get in, come here in the U.S. Was, is a different story. Uh, try to get a job. I came from a good, you know, well-to-do family, but when you get here, you don't have any money. You have to have a job. By graduate in time, I don't, on time, I don't mean um, from, I mean from high school. I had to be, I don't want, didn't want to be fall, falling behind. That was a big deal for me. Uh, I always wanted to go to Berkeley, um, since I remember, way back. Um, and I was, always wanted to be a physicist. Um, so... I, I had that goal and I got, got to Berkeley and physics again, I'm still running. And how I changed to medical school is a different story. But again, it's on the path of continue to run. And after medical school, I had to get into a great residency, which I did here. And all of you who are here, congratulations. It's truly a fun place to be. But through all this time, um, 
as an immigrant and somebody who is, continues to run, I always wanted to belong and I always had to prove that I actually deserve to be here. Uh, so it, it's different for all of you, but I was talking to somebody um, who was uh, adopted and, she, and he had exactly the same thing. He was adopted by a family and he, he wanted to show his parents that he was worth it. And it's, it's an interesting thing that a lot of immigrants have and, and it's a very, uh, very unique. But all of you, and I know many of you, um, I feel like many of you are in this run and uh, you are continue to run and you just, you just have to get there and you sometimes don't see around you. And, and yours is different than mine, but yours is as just as unique as as important. But the story, the reason I'm telling you this story is the research part. I think I was continuing to run until I stopped and I thought about research and, I, and not only the research was something that helped me, but it gave me time to stop and think, to look around, to see where I'm going and what I'm doing. It was a very valuable time. It's a time that I would recommend to most of you. You may do it for different reasons. Maybe you want to get your fellowship or maybe you want to do, get your grant, but it gave me time to think. It gave me time to look around and actually for the first time understand what's, what's going on around me, which was a quite a valuable time. Now you may decide to do research, then the question is uh, with whom and who are you going to choose? Uh, I, I, uh, mine was Dr. Mayer, who you know very well, and uh, Eileen uh, did her research during her third year and I had some information about Dr. Mayer and I worked with him. What I want to tell you is obviously you want to choose somebody that is um, wise, it's not just about, all about him or her, uh, but there are other things that you should probably think about. Um, I have seen a lot of people choose wrongly. Uh, uh, I, we, had, I, we had a great friend who was a very hard worker and smart person who wanted to do research, chose a mentor who was also outstanding. But these two had different ideas, different way of thinking. And it didn't go well. I was very happy, but I, you know, when you look at the lab or somebody that you work with, tight versus loose. And by that I mean, uh, and bo both are fine, but somebody who is going to very organized lab that everything has to be done the same exact way versus, no, there are different ways you can do it. You have to be careful what, which one you choose. If you are somebody who needs a lot of organization, if you go to a lab that is looser, you may not, you may not like it. And the reverse is true. I wasn't one that wanted a tight uh, thing around my neck and, uh, and the lab at Dr. Mayer's lab really gave me that opportunity to look around. Step by step versus three dimensional view. Both are fine. There are groups of people and I, in the research I have noticed that they go from A to B to C and that is a very valid way and it's a great way. There are others and, and May, Dr. Mayer is one of them that can go out and see the three dimensional and go from one to another without going stepwise but there is danger in that too depends on what kind of person you are. If you are an A, B, C, D person, don't go with somebody who's going to go big jump. You are going to be lost. So again, choose your uh, mentors wisely. Big versus small. So this one is, uh, is interesting because people look around and, um, and they want to find the most famous person to work with. And, uh, and that is okay. For instance, I work with Dr. Mayer. Now, in a in whole year, if Dr. Mayer thinks about me twice, I'll be happy. Those two, ice, two times are worth it. But remember, he has a number of mentors I, I can, on top of my head, name 50 immediately. So there are different ways to do it. Like Kate recently uh, stayed with uh, Gianna. Now, Gianna is not as famous as Dr. Mayer, but the way Gianna is doing with Kate is very interesting because it's taking it, okay, you need today to talk to Flum, you need to talk to our Bobby today. And it's just as well. So choosing, it's sort of like choosing a big university uh, versus a smaller university for your undergrad. Both have their own valid points. Again, choose wisely, depends on how you like to do it. Both are okay. So what to do? Uh, there are lots of things to do. And I chose, as Dr. Mayer already mentioned, I chose many of them. Uh, transitions, uh, transitional research, laboratory research, outcome, and health services. I work with a lot, and, and the health services and outcome is just as important. Today I will talk about the laboratory part, but this is because 
Dr. O'Keefe has a lot more important things to tell you, and I have limited time. But I've worked with many of you who are in this audience uh, the, with, my lab, uh, with my outcomes research. Some of them are sitting there um, with Flynn O'Brien. Uh, we, we worked in the things, and, and I work with lab with Ravi a little bit. So I've worked with many of you and uh, Gianna later on, and all of, the, all, of you peop all of them have done outstanding, and I'm so happy that I work with them in, in the outcomes research part. But, um, but today I will talk about the laboratory part. And again, the goal is not to teach, tell you, or what I'm doing in the lab, to tell you what some of the things that I think I did right and some of the things I would have d d done differently. Part of a big organizational consortium. This one, I don't think I did well. Um, uh, when you look around, there are all these consortiums organizations, ARDS group or other groups. And then my partners, especially Eileen Bodger, Grant O'Keefe, and Joe Kushkiri, have done really well joining these organizations, uh, from Rock uh, to Glue Grant. And that will really help you. First of all, in my opinion, uh, it's easier a little bit. You're part of a group. Everybody knows you. Uh, start, you start to know people in the community. By community, I mean the community of people that you work with. And being part of this, if you get an opportunity to do so, join them. It is quite helpful. And I would, uh, if I get an opportunity, I certainly would try to join. But that, that is a much better, I think that is an avenue that you definitely have to be part of these days. So I'm going to shift gear to laboratory data. And again, as I told you, the goal is not to teach you exactly or, or tell you exactly what I do. Uh, it is to convey some of the issues that I've been dealing with. So I started getting interested in P38 MAPK. And the only thing you need to know today about P38 MAPK, it's a sort of a key regulator in inflammatory response. If you look at this list, though, I won't go in it, it's involved in all aspects. It's, it's a pathway that goes back to yeast. And we have homology of 60 to 70% with yeast even. So it tells you it's an important pathway. And it's a pathway important in other factors. But here, inflammation is the one that I'm interested in. So I learned that we can modify that with the inhibitors of the P38 that are available. Uh, in, and many companies make them. And by the way, that becomes interesting at the end of the talk. So my idea was this, that if you are going to use inflammatory modulators and you give an inflammatory modulator systemically, you're going to hit many things. For instance, if you're interested in inflammation in one area, but you give it systemically, you will hit the lungs. And if you are going to get a pneumonia, you may not have the appropriate response that you want. So I always thought that local or uh, administration uh, of the inflammatory modulators rather than systemic is much better. You will get to the point, to the area that you are interested without having the side effects. So, the model that I chose was burn. For in that burn model, instead of giving systemic inflammatory modulators, I like to give it topically. By giving it topically, my idea was that I would shield the uh, organis or, or organism or the animal or human being from seeing that inflammatory source uh, from uh, being active. So I started it. In the lab later on, I used the rat and mouse model. I would use the topical inhibitor on top of the burn. So this uh, uh, subject had a burn at the back, and then a topical inhibitor was applied afterwards. As you know, burns cause a lot of inflammatory response. So my thought was, what if I do this topically, give it to them, and then look at a group that, that had burn, uh, and a group that had burn with a topical inhibitor. My idea was the animals with a topical inhibitor would not have that inflammatory source. And it just, just to show you some of the slides, it showed that, yes, if you look at inflammatory, and here I, I just look at IL-6, if you have a burn, boom, it goes up. And you use that modulator, you can inhibit that production of in, uh, cytokine from the site of injury that is burned. So you can modify inflammation. And if you look systemically, it's very interesting. Look at, look at this side. Uh, look, look at the side that's uh, sham, burn, and SP, which is the uh, P38 inhibitor. I extracted the fluid from the lung after giving uh, an albumin, blue-based albumin, so albumin that is colored. So albumin should not be in your lungs in the liquid form coming out. If it is, it means that your lungs are wet and leaking. When you have a sham animal, there is no blue. When you add the burn, suddenly the animal goes into the systemic inflammatory response, and you see a lot of blue out there. 
When I used a topical inhibitor, again, the animal did not see that inflammatory source, so it didn't get sick. And my thought was now this animal is also ready to respond to an infection. So if you look at these graphs, it's burn and then after burn giving the animal pneumonia. The animals that had burn and then pneumonia later, they really did poorly. And that's as far as this is, uh, if you look at the one that says uh, burn, alone look at the survival, there was mortality rate of 75% uh, and survival of 25%. When you look at the graph here, this is the graph I'm talking about, but these two are sham and the burn with the inhibitor. When do I applied the inhibitor, the animal model did not see that as a burn and acted like a sham and also able to fight the infection. So then I said, that's great. And uh, also for people who are in burns, they understand that there is an area of necrosis immediately, but there is an area of stasis where the cells are sort of not dead. Some of them are going through apoptosis and that increase in depth later on can increase the depth of burn injury. And the idea was that P38 would inhibit that. And in fact, we looked at it and it was a significant inhibition of apoptosis. So depth of burn change also. Then, so basically, a summary was that we figured this out, that topical inhibitor does modulate inflammatory system, improves the organ function in the rat model, and decreases the apoptosis. But what about wound healing? As uh, Dr. Mayer already told the story, the idea was, how can I look at wound healing? But then here, you have to find a new model. Finding a new model because rats and, and mice don't heal like human beings or not even similar, and finding a model that is actually similar is difficult. Uh, Dr. Engrov and Dr. Gibran have worked with Red Duroc and as before them, but they established that model to, model to be similar to human being as far as wound healing, as far as scarring. So I used that model, and this is the PIC model. Initially, we used dermatome to make wounds in this and see what happens. And then we looked at uh, how fast the wounds heal. And when I looked at the wounds healing, I don't want to go into the slide in depth, but basically, the wound started epithelializing with the topical inhibitor much faster. So this is on epithelialization. So when we gave the topical inhibitor, they became epithelialized. There is always a contracture involved in the wound, and something that you don't like, uh, especially if it's over a joint. And if you look at it, this is one wound that over uh, multiple uh, uh, weeks, the how it contracts and pulls things across. And when we looked at the contracture on P38 inhibitor, that contracture was also inhibited. So we didn't get that contracture, which was a good thing. So I like these studies. And then I just want to show you this uh, model of skin. And this is HNE. and uh, When you look at the h &E, let me find my arrow. This is normal skin, hair follicles, normal skin, fat. This is an area where we created a wound with dermatome. You can see the residual the part that is normal that we didn't damage with the uh, dermatome. And then this is two to three weeks afterwards. This is all the inflammatory response that comes afterwards. And we learned, and people before us, uh, Engrov had looked at this, that this thickness of granulation layer is directly related to the scar that you get later on. Uh, this is also very interesting that it's important that residual this to be thin, but to be there. If you go all the way to fat, then you don't get the scarring. And I'll show you a, a slide. And I learned that um, somewhat a hard way, although I could have probably learned it the easy way if I had talked to Dr. Engrov in depth. Then we went to the burn model because that's what it's more inflammatory. The, the cut is clean cut, but the burn is much more inflammatory. And we use the in burn model. But remember, the pigs, the back is curved. So you can't use a big block because it won't touch everything the same way. So we had to use a bottle that you see at the corner with a, with, with a way that it will hug the skin and give you uniform burn. That took us a while to learn. This is the only uh, uh, heat map that I'm going to show you. But the point being that in this burn model, when you look at this, this is wound healing array. Look at the first portion. And you can see the normal skin being here. This is all normal skin without burn. You see there are some cells that are activated, some uh, pathways that are activated, and many that are not. This is the group with burn without the inhibitor. Many pathways that were active or less active or, or relatively. And then there's all this array that includes uh, coll collagenases, inflammatory that get activated. This is the same when we use the topical inhibitor. I don't want to show you more like graphs, but it's clear 
that there is something that we do different here. This is three days out. And when I saw this, I was very happy. Uh, the burn is very different than the clean cut that I show you. This is an H&E that you saw there is a residual. Here, this is the area, the depth of the burn. This is sort of normal. This is after healing a little bit. You see the collagen is not so <coughs> tightly wound. But when we were have to look at this H&E, we have to keep that in mind, that it's not as easy to look at it. But enough to say is that that uh, inflammatory zone is still there. And with the topical inhibitor, that inflammatory zone is much less. And we were hoping that scar would be less. So we looked at the scar. Here is the scar. If this is a cut of the burn in an animal. So remember, it was small until the pig started getting big. So the wound also gets bigger. This is the entire wound from one side. This is the middle of it. This is one margin, and this is another margin. You see the middle, there is scar, but the scar is not thick. This is because the middle was deep that went full thickness. And I told you, if you go full thickness, you won't get the hypertrophic scarring. So the middle is the atrophic scarring that you see. The sides are the hypertrophic scarring you see. And this is, this is the depth of the scar. And it's very similar to human being in this model as far as hypertrophic scarring. I was hoping that this scar would be less with the topical inhibitor. The data is still in there, and I, but just look at this. It's, it's a few of the animals that have come out. Anything above four here is the one that did not have a topical, and this is all the one with the topical. So, and that's very exciting because there are not a lot of things that we can use to um, decrease scarring in the animal model. And if this turns out to be okay in human model, it's also important. So, this is where the teaching moment comes, is or or what I what I the, my what I'm going to talk about is. So we, in animals, I sh we showed systemically it's better in the rat and mouse model, and there is no inflammation; they get less sick or they don't see it. So the topical basically shields the animal from that source of inflammation. In uh, the dermal scarring, uh, I. Uh, I showed that the scarring in at least the pigs is less, uh, by I, I mean our group. Uh, and that was interesting too. So one would say, okay, this is ready to go to human being. It's easy to apply, it's topical, it's less toxic. And if all of these studies showed this, well, why don't you go to human being? So this is the teaching model is, um, I lacked the business model from the beginning. Uh, or the business plan. And if you guys do SBRTs or small business grants, uh, which I did review some of those, uh, you can see, you, they, will, they will point the business part, to really push the business part more than anything. And initially, as, as a scientist, I said, who cares? I mean, why, why do I care? And then I learned, no, that's not, that's not the way uh, the universe works. Um, if you are a physicist, you always have the things, I don't know how many of you know uh, Tesla versus Edison. So Edison is this famous guy because he invented the electric bubble. But the reality is that is not true at all. Edison took everything from Tesla. Tesla had done this all, and he was the brain of it. And every physicist knows that Tesla, I mean, is one of the gurus. And Edison basically did nothing as far as that. But not many people know about Ed, uh, Tesla, and everybody knows about Edison. And if you want to piss off a physicist, go and talk to them about how good Edison is and how important that is. <laughs> that would really get you in there. But uh, it's the same thing as more like uh, Wozniak versus uh, Jobs. Now, it, it, Wozniak is the one that actually made the computers, but Jobs is the one that is famous. I always thought, oh man, this is like stupid. Jo Jobs should not be famous at all, until I got to my problem and I realized you need somebody like uh, Edison, or well, Edison stole it, so you don't you don't want Edison, <laughs> but but you want somebody like Jobs who takes the studies and actually makes them applicable and makes it something real. And I see a lot of my colleagues working with pharmaceuticals now, and I I, I understand why. So I am not poo pooing that at all anymore. So. This, this, this topical is it's, it's owned not by me. It was already made by other pharmaceuticals. Now some of them are buying each other. This, the P38 inhibitor is now in studies, in third phase studies, for some medical thing that I can't even name, and it's probably one in a million people have it. And I couldn't understand why this pharmaceutical company is going after this. 
and, and, and they are using the pill, and I wanted to use it for my model. They said, no, 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 we are in the third phase. I, we can't jeopardize this because if you suddenly find something negative, then we have to report it and may stop it. Well, I realized later that if this passes for this little thing that one out of a million people maybe have to use it, then it, it's out there. And I can use it, and you can use it, anybody can use it for anything else. So the pharmaceuticals are depending on that. And when I talk to people that are here for helping me to transition, they basically look at me and say, oh, yeah, you know, yeah, you're screwed a little bit. You're sort of dependent on them. So have a business model and business plan. And if you can find somebody like Jobs or Edison, that if you are not that, find that person from the beginning and work with them. Uh, that's a mistake I did uh, that I would, not, uh, I would not repeat again, and it's important. Don't be a nerd like me. Uh, the person who takes this to the, um, to the public or to industry is just as important, in my opinion, now. So um, I have worked with a lot of people, and that's, that's the great, great part of it. Um, uh, Many of them are sitting here, and many of them teach me a lot. The research part is interesting because every time we work with, um, with Flynn O'Brien, Ravi, or others that are here within research, they had time, and, and they would say things that I like. I had worked in this area for epidemiology or for the science for all these years, and in a matter of like five months when they had a time off to think, they had come, come up with ideas that I had never thought about, and, they were outstanding. So I would tell you to do, do the research, do the thinking, and uh, it's a great time to think. I'll also tell you there's all the team. And the team, some of it, I put the name up here, but the tree team is really trauma and burn. All of my colleagues in trauma and burn, and I work with them, all of them, many of them are sitting here, and I work with them for many years. And that is part of your team also, even if they are not in the lab with you or in epidemiology with you. And uh, I would respect all of them. and I truly appreciate all the, um, all the things that I have uh, received and all the opportunities uh, that I would have not. And I am one that is very thankful for all of it. So thank you for all of you for being part of it. And I'm continuing. I, uh, two days ago, Nicole Gibran gave me a book that it says, Advice to Young Scientists. So I, I, it made me very happy because at least it, it feels like I am a young scientist, at least relative to others. So. I loved it. Thank you. Uh, thank you, everybody. The uh, second half of the uh, session is by another senior colleague who's been in Harborview for, uh, seems like, again, forever. Uh, actually, Grant came to us from training in Canada to join the laboratory uh, as a postdoctoral fellow. Also obtained his MPH in epidemiology while I was there, which is Again, the younger people in the room don't understand it, but back then in trauma, there was a great need for knowledge in epidemiology and having the skills of an MPH. And there was very little option out there to obtain those credentials and that knowledge. And so what I was able to do with the fellowship was to make it a combination of, at that time, a basic laboratory and learning the skills for basic research and being competitive at the NIH, but simultaneously, because of the great uh, opportunities in the School of Public Health is to obtain the MPH and to actually further enhance uh, the potential and uh, opportunities for the fellows that went through the uh, process. But as I say, Grant came to us from Canada. He did the fellowship. Uh, I didn't mention he is Sam. Sam went to the University of Michigan for his first job and became a lover of Burns. Dr. O'Keefe went to Parkland, my original uh, residency site, and became a lover of genetics and nutrition. And again, learned from experts there in the field of uh, genetic uh, uh, mutations and also uh, worked extensively in the ICU setting with the nutrition services there and the application and abilities of nutrition to affect outcome in the ICU. Grant? Thank you, Sam, and Dr. Mayer. Um, Sam tells a good story, and uh, I don't. Um, the last time Sam and I did this together, he left me with 15 minutes, so... 
thank you. I was my 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 talk has had has one half, so we can have time for time for time for questions. I think. Um, I think a couple of things that 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 Sam mentioned are really important about um, and s about sort of our research research environment, and sometimes um, I forget what the environment is like in this department. Um, there's not a lot of places where residents and fellows and trainees have, have such a breadth of experience and knowledge and, and potential for mentorship at a lot of different levels. And, um, and I think that, that, that I forget that sometimes. Um, there's also, we also have, so that's, there's, a, there's a lot of sort of, um, sort of un, sort of subjective things that we forget. But the other thing that is often, that is pretty amazing about our department is that we have two T32s. There's not many, and T32, what is that? I think some of you have heard about what they are when you come to interview as interns, but you know, it's basically an opportunity to step out of your clinical training and to do some, some mentored research. And that's the, that's the idea behind it. And there's not a lot of departments that have such a breadth of opportunities. Um, Dr. Mayer and Dr. Carrico uh, started one 30 years ago in our division, which is still going. Uh, Dr. Flum has this has source in the outcomes research, and then obviously there's other opportunities for fellows and residents too. Uh, so the breadth of research opportunities is is huge, um, and I think the other thing, the other I guess sometimes underappreciated consequence is the benefit to us, the benefit to the Dr. Mayors and the Dr. Flums and the Dr. O'Keefe's of having the opportunity to work with with residents and fellows, and I think that that's really sort of the background for what I'm gonna talk a little bit about today. Um, my sort of focus of research has, uh, has been on genetics and genomics. Um, my clinical interest has been in nutrition and through m at least three of the faces and the people in this room um, have helped me sort of learn about these different aspects of my research. Dr. Shalhoub, Dr. Sood have worked on my genetic and genomic stuff over the years. Um, and more recently, uh, Dr. Parent has sort of helped me sort of get to this idea that, that there's actually some more interesting things in nutrition. And as a fellow, Brody really took us along, um, sort of started us on this path of sort of understanding nutrition from a, from a different standpoint. And that's what I'm gonna talk a little bit about today. Um, so the objective of this is to talk about protein supplementation to improve outcomes in critical illness. I'm going to talk a little bit about our clinical approach, um, present status of some of our nutritional research. Um, because I'm only going to have one half of this talk, I'm not going to talk about the antioxidant stuff, which is, is, is newer. So what do we know about nutritional, the benefits of nutritional support and trying to understand it? Well, it's a bit of a challenge. The biological benefits are pretty direct, and they're probably relatively easy to measure. You can measure things in the blood. You can measure things um, in tissues. Um, the clinical benefits are obviously more relevant, but they're really often difficult to prove. And really what we want to show is that, is that a, a, an approach to nutritional support improves patient outcomes. And obviously there's a lot of different things that, that interact with what we do nutritionally to try to improve how our patients do. And so these two things, I think the fact that biological measures are measurable and easy to study, and clinical measures are a little more difficult to study, makes for a topic that is ideally suited to sort of this translational type of research where you look at clinical things and you look at biological measures and you take those two and it's essentially a reciprocal process where you look at things in the lab, you look and see how those relate to things clinically, and then you take your clinical observations and you go back to the lab again. And I think as surgeons, that's exactly what we're suited to do. So the bit of this, this shorter story starts um, with this paper that was published in 2016. And this is an update on the guidelines for nutritional support by the Society of Critical Care Medicine and ASPEN. Um, this is like a lot of different guidelines that we're familiar with. Um, and I'm going to focus on one today. And how they wrote these was that they asked a question, they had a little bit of a suggestion, and then some rationale. And this is the one I want to focus on. Does the amount of protein that we give patients improve clinical outcomes in the ICU? 
and they suggest that sufficient, and they refer to high-dose protein, should be provided. Protein requirements are expected to be in the range of 1.2 to 2 grams. Now, that's typically a lot more than we've given in the past. And in fact, I'll show you that it's pretty hard to get there with our standard approaches. So the next piece of this is that they give a bit of rationale. And what I want to talk, just fo focus on is that they base this recommendation on an observational study where patients, if they were given more protein, they tended to do better, whereas those better outcomes were less likely related to more calories. And this is a little bit of anathema to what we know, is that we've always focused on calories and getting patients calories, and everything else has sort of come along with that, other nutrients and proteins. So after this, there's a lot of studies that sort of, sort of have, have, have begun. There's a couple of studies looking fo focusing solely on amino acid supplementation. There's another study that's starting that's looking at you know, giving patients some type of protein, whether you give it enterally or whether you're giving it, giving it intravenously, but the point is, is to give them more. And then there's sort of the, the focus that, that, that I and we're taking is that let's focus on enteral protein. And there's a couple of reasons that um, I think that this is important. Um, and I'm just going to take a step back to some of Brody's work. This is um, the, title, the title of a paper that he published. And it was our idea that let's look and see how different forms of nutrition in critically ill patients affect sort of metabolic responses. And so what, what Brody did is he took, he took 10 patients that we started feeding enterally, 10 patients that we started feeding ten, perennially, and 10 patients, 10 healthy volunteers as, as a control. And this is just sort of a, a summary of those patients. Now, you're not going to get away without me showing some heat maps like Sam. This is a... Dr. Poirez came in the, in, to be one of our lecturers in, the, in 2015. He gave this to David Flum. I'll just read it. Today, Flum, with admiration for his great contributions to patient care and safety. And I don't know if Brody, if I showed this to you, but he sketched a version of this when Brody was giving his presentation with the idea that, well, maybe metabolomics aren't a really good tool to use because it's just a pile of garbage, right? But I can think of a whole bunch of metaphors where looking at the garbage is really helpful. Um, so that's partly what we're doing, is we're looking at the metabolic response, which is sort of the end product of all our metabolism and our genomics and our proteomics and what happens. And so I'm going to show a few, a little bit of data. And so just to orient, this is a heat map. And what that means is that this is just relative and when you see it in terms of gene expression, so the cancer doctors here are very familiar with looking at this in the terms of gene expression in tumors. The, um, the darker or blue is a relatively lower level of whatever we're looking at. The red is a relatively higher level. And what, what I'm showing here is a list of metabolites. And from 10 subjects on the day that they received enteral nutrition. And these are all relative to our healthy controls. And now what I wanted to point out is, is that is that this is in response to enteral nutrition, and there were a number of metabolites that changed over time. And it turns out that the majority of those seem to be related to two different things, oxidative stress and protein metabolism. This is what it looks like in response to parenteral nutrition. I only want to point out one thing. I want to point out citrulline. In the previous slide, <coughs> citrulline started low and gradually increased in response to enteral nutrition. In parenteral nutrition, it didn't. And that's just one example of a number of metabolites that seem to respond differently to enteral and parenteral nutrition. This is just sort of that taking that data and sh focusing on it specifically. So the point behind this is that, is that it seems that there are metabolites that are important that respond differently to enteral nutrition. So in addition to my bias that enteral nutrition is important, there are some data that have sort of, sort of informed my decision to focus on, on supplementing protein. Now, obviously, it's a lot easier to give amino acids intravenously. Within a day, you can give somebody as many calories, as many grams of protein or amino acids that they need. It's a lot harder to do that enterally. So what we wanted to do was to see if we could actually do that. And so that's what was the next step. So we took 50 critically ill patients. And we prospectively enrolled them in a study where we designed a way to give them more protein. <laughs> so we would feed them normally. And while we were giving them more enteral nutrition, we would immediately give them a modular protein. 
and just give them two grams. And rather than waiting to see if they develop protein deficits, let's just give them a lot of protein. And then as they get more nutrition, we can slow down the amount of protein. And just as a reminder, two grams is about 18 ounces of steak. So that's a lot. Um, we didn't know if we could do this, so we wanted to see if we could do it safely and if we could actually achieve what we wanted to achieve. And so in those 53 patients, I'll just show you a little bit of their data. This is the amount of calories that we were able to give them over the course of their first, their first two weeks in the ICU. And our target is about 25 kilocalories per kilogram. And you can see by about four days, we're pretty good at getting them to where they needed to be with their calories. And that's pretty typical. I think most places are, are, are able to do that. Um, this is how much protein they would get. And we actually use a fairly high protein formula already. But for example, let's just go to day four. These patients were getting full caloric support, but getting well below the amount of protein that we're now recommending that they would get. So at the same time, we were also supplementing their protein independently. And this is about how much we, were, we gave them with their supplemental protein. And so then when you look at their total protein, you can see that by day four, we were getting patients to where they needed to be. So it looks like we can actually achieve what we want to achieve using enteral protein. Now, these were pretty highly selected patients. These are patients that we thought were safe to feed and that were actually going to be getting to, 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 to sort of adequate nutrition pretty quickly. We also wanted to look at a little bit at the safety. A um, couple of ways to look at that. One is biochemically. I wanted to make sure that we weren't making patients azotemic. And as you can see, and this is pretty typical for patients in the ICU, they often start with a relatively high, little higher creatinine and it comes down. Um, and this is pretty typical too, is that over time their BUN actually goes up. So they have different, they, they, they have different responses. And I wanted to know whether or not this was as a result of the more protein that we were giving them. And so when I, then what we did was I looked at the amount of protein a patient got in the first week, and broke those up into groups, and then looked to see what their blood urea nitrogen was in the second or in third week. And it was interesting because, in fact, the patients that got less protein had generally higher BUNs. And I'm not entirely sure what that means, but what I, that one of the explanations could be is that by giving them more protein, we're actually preventing them from breaking down their own protein. So there may actually be something that's happening biologically um, in this small group of patients. We looked at a bunch of different things. We compared patients that we enrolled to patients that didn't get extra protein. What we noticed that is that they did actually develop, they did increase their visceral proteins a little more quickly. They did have lower BUN and creatinine after two weeks. They had better year, they had higher urine nitrogen excretion. I'm not quite sure what that means yet. Uh, but importantly, we didn't notice any increased risk for vomiting or aspiration. And we were particularly attentive to this because we were pretty, we were pretty aggressive about giving patients extra, extra feeding. So this has led us to do the next step, and we're actually randomizing patients to this approach. So we're randomizing patients to pretty aggressive approach, protein supplementation to, to no protein supplementation. Uh, we're going to exclude pretty sick patients, patients who are severely malnourished, because I don't think it's reasonable not to give those patients more protein. We're going to exclude patients who are likely to die, so bad traumatic brain injuries or very elderly. Um, I've also decided that we initially, when we enrolled patients, we, we left patients out who had a creatinine of greater than 1.5. Towards the end of that, we decided to be more aggressive. And it seems that up to a creatinine of 2, it's pretty safe also exclude patients with, with chronic liver disease. And so part of this study is not only to look at the clinical outcomes, but to also look at the metabolomics and the proteomics and to identify networks and pathways, sort of as, as Dr. Ababi mentioned about MAP kinases and other things that might be affected by protein supplementation. So we began enrolling in, in 2016. We've randomized 243 patients. About 260 have been screened but not enrolled, and we hope to enroll about 500 subjects. This will give us an 80% power to determine but a three-day difference in ventilator-free days. So does the, it, this is just a little bit of a, a peek into the data to look at the, this we did, I looked at the data about you know, maybe a couple of months ago. Um, so formula protein, on average, by about day four or five, we're giving the patients about a gram overall, and then the two groups, this is the patients who are getting the supplemental protein. So this is them and no treatment or the non-supplemental protein. So they're pretty similar in their, in their formula protein intake. And then this is their supplemental protein intake. And of course, it's going to be higher in these patients. And these, I think, just reflect the reality of a clinical trial. Sometimes patients who are in the treatment group did get supplemental protein. Um, 
And this is where the money is. So the treatment group, again, the lighter bars. And as you can see, in that group, by day four, day five, at least half of them are getting up to two grams. Uh, probably about 75 to 100 percent more protein. So it seems like we're able to do it in the context of a clinical trial. I don't see any differences in their BUNs. I don't see any differences in their creatinine over the course of their stay. And this is one of the endpoints that we're interested in, is actually can we improve biochemical measures of, 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 of their nutritional status? And this is pretty preliminary, and I'm not going to, you know, it looks like maybe we're starting to see higher levels in the treatment group, but um, certainly not going to be able to tell that for a while. So in summary, protein may be more important than calories in surgical and critical care nutrition. I think enteral nutrition has important metabolic effects that are specific to protein metabolism and important. And we're testing this approach that increases enteral protein for both its clinical and biologic effects. And I think this is just an example of, of sort of how my research has involved, evolved. And a lot of that has been because of working with, working with my colleagues and working with, with fellows. Um, you know, we identify new things in different areas. There's a lot of people that have worked on this. Dan Raftery is the metabolomics uh, center director. Sandy Navarro is a nutritionist and metabolomics expert from the Fred Hutch. Obviously, Brody Parent was one of our was one of our fellows and is a chief resident now. Marilyn Shelton, many of you know, she's a dietitian in the, at Harborview and the TICU. And then all the high Harborview dietitians have been involved in this. And then, of course, um, all of my colleagues at Harborview have had to listen to this over and over again and participate. And this is where I get to do my thinking. Thank you. Thank you, Grant. Thank you both. Uh, we have a few minutes and time for questions, which I'm sure you have probing deep philosophic questions for both of them. Uh, I know no one will say anything, so I'll start. Um, actually, uh, cutting across both talks, it, it's a little bit of an expansion of, of what something Sam said in one of his talks and advice I would like to reinforce and, and add to the discussion for young people in the audience. Um, is the, um, the need and the uh, what wisdom of using the opportunities for expanding your interests and getting outside your comfort zone. And I think both of these talks describe that very well. As I mentioned, Grant went to uh, Dallas and teamed up with some geneticists and with the nutritionists there, which is not something he learned during his residency, just as the rest of you don't learn about genetic mutations during your surgical residency. And he expanded his, his potential and his future directions Sam went to Michigan and became a burn lover, um, but went out, his, out of his comfort zone of where he had been and used those observations and saw the, the basic science that he'd been studying had a direct applicability in a very clinically relevant issue. And you'll find even if you don't go into the research arenas, if you always do what you're comfortable with, which in my case, trauma, it, it, it's great and you're comfortable and you really do become an expert and, and you can work in that arena in that field, but your real growth curves when you start to get outside that, outside your comfort zone and take on challenges, new arenas, new interests that you have to learn and, and you aren't as comfortable, you're not the expert in that you're just like everyone else, using your mind to learn and, and keep moving forward. If you don't do that, you stagnate and you really shortchange yourself. So always be open to that. But that's my question to both of you. Come on up here. Grant, Sam. Uh, well, obviously I agree. <laughs> so. Um, no, I, I think that is very important to learn uh, and get out of, get out and learn from people that, uh, that, 
that is different than you know and then walk into it, it's very difficult uh, at first. It's like anything though, uh, when you start at the beginning, it's very difficult. I, all, I think adding collaborators to your group that ha add to your knowledge level is very important. Working with people becomes really important. But, um, but learning is very, uh, it's, it's very enticing. It's scary at times getting into a field, but after you got into it and when you worked in it, it becomes very rewarding. I don't know what Grant thinks. I think that's, I, I, so it's, it's interesting. This is a little bit of a, sort of a different tact than I think a lot of surgery takes, is that we want to become experts in one thing because that's best for our patients. And, and this is not to discount that. But I think, I think having challenging yourself, and my challenge was when I went to Texas and I worked with an LPS biologist. And I had never worked in a basic science lab before. And it was hard. I mean, I, I mean, it was new skills. My, my thought processes were challenged all the time. And it was probably, in, uh, aside from the MPH year, it was probably the best few years of my career. Um, something a little bit different. And changed the path of, certainly changed the path of my career um, in ways that um, I think have been, have been pretty wonderful. So I'll make another comment in a, a couple of minutes, but I have a question for both of you, and, and Sam, particularly, you touched upon it, which is, what, what advice do you have on choosing a research mentor? Uh, how much of it is luck uh, versus deliberate, and how, how, how deliberate can one be for the residents who are looking forward to both their research mentorship during residency, but then after residency, because that how you ramp up and start up when you become a faculty member is as important as what you do during residency. What what's the secret to success? I, I luck has a lot to do with it. So uh, I'm not one of those that stands up here and says because of my hard work I got this and got that. When you when I go back through my entire life, I see things that I had were totally out of my control and may change my life drastically from one to another. So um, truly luck has a lot to do with it, but that doesn't mean that you have, uh, you, ha you have some control. And I think I gave you my advice as far as choosing a mentor. I was very happy, but I also got information from people. I talked to Eileen, I, I met Dr. Mayer and talked to him. And I, again, uh, what I want to uh, emphasize is don't go to somebody because, oh no, this is the most famous one in that field. And that may be the right thing for you, but look at their character and be sure that your characters match. Uh, that's what I meant from, you know, somebody goes from A to B to C versus somebody who jumped. You know, you have to be fitting in that. How tight or loose it is, it has to be fitting. So be sure that your character m meets. Just, uh, there is not one mentor. Every one of us has many mentors. I have many mentors in many fields that I work in. Uh, and the mentor doesn't have to be even older than you. Uh, so, like when it comes to burn reconstruction nowadays, I, whenever I have a question, I go to Tom Pham. Uh, and he is much younger than me. Or if I have questions regarding some other people, I go to people that are older than me. Not much. <laughs> <laughs> No, but, but, but uh, it is not one mentor that you have and choosing a mentor that knows people and takes you around and uh, introduces you to people, that person is important. So that's my advice. I think that there's a combination of both, but I think the most important thing that we can do as faculty is to create the environment where luck is less important and to give people the best opportunity, whether that's as, as residents in training or junior faculty. Um, I think they're both important, but I, I think we have an important um, responsibility to, to give people the environment. So give them options to choose. Start them early in their, in their exposure to research. Um, and be good at it ourselves. Aside from learning the tools of the trade and what the epidemiologic skill set you need or the metabolomic skill set, maybe you could comment there are 10 million topics that one could choose. How did you narrow down and select 
a subject for your research? Well, I think that that sometimes is more luck. Um, and I think that that's, that's a good thing. Um, I was, I happened to start my genetics research when it was sort of starting off. The technology was available to look at genetic differences in ways that we couldn't do that before. And I had mentors who were, who were ready to do that in a place that had the resources to do it. Um, and so some of that is, I think some of that is luck and timing. And, and I think the same thing happened with the nutrition research. I mean, it always had a clinical interest in it, but never really a sort of a translational res research interest. And, and Brody helped me develop that. And then there was an environment that, that fostered it. I, I, I totally agree. Um, um, I think huh, it may not come as a surprise to people who know me that I like controversial topics. Uh, I, 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 yes, people, uh, I, I don't like thing, to do research to prove something that is already done, which is, by the way, very important. I, I'm, not, uh, I, I'm truly not putting that, that part down, but I like things that are different, like using topical instead of systemic. When everybody was going systemic, it was important to me to choose something that was a little bit different. But I think ultimately luck and the group of people that come to you uh, as, as people who say, hey, listen, can you help me with this? And um, they want to do some research in the area that you have not done. And then they talk to you and you get excited. And as a quote unquote, their mentor, you get into that topic and it helps you more than helps the mentees, which is very interesting. Doug, you had another comment, sure. So, can, can I just, so that you don't think it's all luck, the word's been used a lot, and I'm not denying that luck doesn't exist, but I would also propose that these lucky people, just like many other lucky people, or rather people who are uh, faced with opportunities and recognize them as opportunities and they take those opportunities and then therefore they're lucky. So it's not just a random event that hits you while you're crossing the street. I would argue lucky people recognize the opportunities that are provided and pursue those and provide hard work and dedication and therefore they're lucky. Yeah, and I'll just make a couple of closing comments because um, uh, I agree with everything that uh, uh, Dr. Mayer just said, but I want to point out the importance of these research-focused rounds. I mean, uh, uh, what I want to emphasize is that research is an important part of what we do in the Department of Surgery. We have a lot of, of our grand rounds and our visiting professorships that are dedicated to, to clinical or educational uh, uh, aspects that are also a, a core part of our mission. But we, I want to call out that we specifically have uh, these times to recognize the research that is done in the department. And this is just a snapshot. I mean, this is a, a snapshot from two senior and very prolific uh, surgeon scientists. And obviously, we have more uh, uh, individuals in this room who are also uh, doing research that forwards the, the field of surgery and uh, helps our department uh, be innovative in terms of what we're doing. So I want to uh, comment on uh, Dr. O'Keefe, who turns out does tell a good story. Uh, so uh, it's a different story than, uh, than Dr. Arbabi's, but it's a great story. And uh, when, when I'm able to understand uh, a topic that's not in my uh, wheelhouse in my area of expertise, that's a sign that you tell a good story. And, and I want to thank both of you for the mentorship that you provide to, to the residents uh, and fellows and the opportunities that you provide. But I, I also want to emphasize the environment at Harborview that, uh, that allows this type of research and collaboration. And it's a environment that uh, Dr. Mayer uh, and Dr. Bulger and Dr. Gibran have uh, fostered and, and create and make a rich team that's a great clinical team, 
uh, uh, as well as a great uh, scientific team. So uh, congratulations to you, Ron, uh, for the team that you put together and the type of individuals that you've recruited that have been residents and fellows with, with you and then have gone on to now be senior leaders within the department and within the field. So I think it's a cause for celebration. So thanks very much, uh, Grant and Sam.